Okay, bueno, bienvenidos. My name is Paul Gleeson. I'm the Ambassador of Ireland in Chile, Peru and Ecuador. And I want to welcome you today as the Embassy celebrates St. Bridget's Day, which is the 1st of February every year. And in recent years, our Irish embassies and consulates around the world have used St. Bridget's Day to celebrate the achievements of Irish women who have achieved excellence in their respective fields. And it's in this vein that I'm delighted today that we are joined by somebody who absolutely fits that description, the brilliant director, creator, art creator and character designer at Brown Bag Films, Brown O'Hanlon. Brown Bag Films is, of course, one of Ireland's most famous animation studios. And with them, Brona has participated and led on numerous television and film coll collaborations with the likes of Warner Brothers, Nickelodeon, Disney, Netflix, and many others, resulting in multiple Oscar, BAFTA, Emmy, and other nominations, and many awards too. So Brona, thank you so much for making time in what I know is your incredibly busy diary to join us today, and happy St. Bridget's Day. I have no worries at all. It's, it's always good to do something different in these you know, crazy times we're in right now. Absolutely. Well, listen, Brona, I, I mean, we'll, we'll come to your remarkable career and its origins in a minute. But just before we, we get started, tell us a little bit about Brownback Films, the company you've worked for for almost 20 years. I mean, it's a phenomenal Irish success story. Can you give us an insight into why animation has been such a success story for Ireland? And what is it about Brownback particularly that has resulted in such recognition and popularity globally? Well, I mean, like Ireland has always been a creative country. I think we've taken a lot of pride in that, you know, over the years, you know, it's um, with the writers, you know, music, um, art. And I think a lot of the government caters a lot to that in certain respects, you know, um, like with the film and animation industry, there's a lot of, you know, tax breaks, you know, and for um, artist exemptions and these sort of really help to nurture, I think, and bring up that field. Um, and also, I think that um, there's there's a lot of um, love for all of that, you know, here over here. And for brown bike films, like um, like you're saying, I started like 20 years ago, and there's only four people in the company back then. Uh, and it just um, growing, I like I sort of grew up with the company, and it's like a family to me. Um, and everyone that came in, they they really tried to 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 keep that going. You know that um, even as it got bigger and bigger, that it was a feeling of that you didn't lose sight um, of the creativity that sort of made us popular. And they've always said, I've heard it so many times, we're creatively led. You know, um, not to lose sight of that. Like it can't be about the money; it has to be about the content. Um, and I've just loved that about it. And um, just you just really see it, like with Kathleen Gaffney and um, Doc. Uh, Daryl O'Connell, who founded it, they just have such a love for us, and they're just like big children who just got this candy store and just made these great shows out of it. I, I come here, like I mean, you, you you've been there as you say, early from the start. I mean, when was it though that you realised you wanted to work in animation, and and kind of were there were there individuals at that at that time, particularly women, any women in the industry you looked up to then, or or how how did it come about for you? Um, well, I mean, I've I've always been creative. I was my dad was always creative. It was it was never a, a question of not going into that field. It was just what you know, uh, what I was going to go into and uh, preferable something that would put, you know, bread on the table. I really did not want to be a starving artist. Um, but I like there used to be these shows on TV, like um, I think um, was it Tony Hart had Morph and there was another show um, where this um, animator brought in um, kids and they would make like stop motion animation from um, Mola you know, or plasticine for anyone who isn't Irish. And I used, I was so sad. I used to like make my own little plasticine figures and pretend I was pressing the button and move it along. And then at the end, I would have nothing to show because it was all in my head anyway. But uh, my mum then, I think, um, showed me an article and it was all on um, Don Bluth Studios uh, because like they came over to Ireland in the 80s and they made stuff like um, American Tale and all dogs go to heaven and I, I didn't even know that you could sort of do that in Ireland really until then it was sort of in the back of my head but um it went on about Dunleary um, Art College and Ballyfermot and how they were like filtering all the artists into these 
um, companies. And, um, and from there, I sort of started finding out that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was made in Ireland. And it was like all these shows was like uh, were coming out of Ireland, you know, that you just assumed were American shows. So like it has been going on that long like it isn't it isn't a new industry it's really taken off now I think with um streaming content and everything you know like there's this whole big grab for content at the moment and I just think um a lot of the studios are benefiting because of that yeah absolutely yeah I, Tony Hart that really brings it back now for anyone who grew up in Ireland in the 1980s um I, I mean it wouldn't have been a very diverse sector back then and I mean happily that's changed today you know not only yourself I mean there's Nora Toomey at Cartoon Saloon, Aoife Doyle and Aoife Nia Perry at Pit Kong, there's Lindsay Adams with Daily Madness it is a more diverse sector today but I'm guessing less so when you started with Brown Bag. I, I, I was very clueless with that like I, I wanted to um, do animation uh, it never occurred to me whether women do animation or not like when I went into college um, I was one of three um, and there was 20 lads and three girls in the class and, and funny enough the class got split in half by the time it got to the third year you know but people had dropped out and all of this but none of the women had dropped out so the ratio you know started to fix itself a bit more but it was only really till I got into college that I sort of you know learned about women in animation because like this was show my age now this is like before the internet really you know so like you you didn't learn about like it was hard enough to learn about animation you know like from the random book or two you m might have been able to find and it was only really when you got to um college that you you sort of found out the history of it you know like the, the like um Mary Blair you know who worked for Disney and like Disney at the time didn't hire any women women were just relegated to to painting like it was like paint by numbers nearly but like it, it, out of all of that Disney had such time for like this amazing like female artist Mary Blair like she, she works on everything um on his shows and films and like um then there's like you know um Lottie is it R Ranger, I think it is um and she she like actually directed the first animated feature film like even before uh um Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs like that gets all the recognition but like 10 years before that she actually did the first one so you realize that they've been kind of in the history of animation right from the start so and it's really just great to sort of see where your history is coming from well and it's just terrific that I mean Ireland has been able to take up that and run with it and create such uh, such a growth area in animation but I mean you know yeah, I mean like it's real it's a lovely I mean like you know yourself Ireland's so small you know like it's it's, it's a small community and like everyone knows everyone else you know goes to the same parties or you know like meets up at the same events and that you know and it's it's really great because you know what what uh one company does and elevates them also elevates the whole industry you know what's good for one is good for everyone yeah, and there does seem to be that real um, solidarity across the sector. Like, I, I mean, your your competitive businesses, you're competing with each other to some degree, but there is a real you you do sense it in the animation industry. And having met with Irish companies and, and Irish professionals in the industry, there is that real sense of solidarity around the industry. Yeah, I, like, I think actually three of the companies um, in, around town, like um, they all went to college together. Like, so yeah. there, it, it's a real uh, I, like it's it's everyone's mates, you know, like are setting up their own company, and it has and now they're all these like um high-powered professionals you know but like they, they all started either being booted out of our college and started their own or like a few years after that when other people graduated it, it was real I think a wild west back then you know and it, it's great to see what's come out of it fabulous I mean just take us inside the world a little bit and I, I mean you you've worked a huge amount you know within these shows in a whole myriad of different roles I, I I mean I'm interested in your approach kind of to to female characters on the shows you've worked on as well and you know to what extent you're trying to balance different things there to what extent you're you know hoping to inspire girls and indeed boys to with the female characters you create um, are you know is part of equality having female vi villains as well and bad girls as well as bad boys well, it's, I mean, it's, got, yeah, like, totally, I, I would agree with all of that. But, um, yeah, when I when I started, um, I was annoyed 
of myself. I mean, like it isn't like you started it because you were annoyed, but like you, in the back of your head, it's this thing that you always sort of felt that it was annoying when um, you're watching shows like Scooby Doo and the female characters were either like the the nerdy one with the glasses or the one that can't do anything and just screams all the time, you know. And the boys always got to be the leaders, even though uh, you couldn't really see it in your head what what they were like uh, bringing to the table, uh, and you're like. When you did see those one or two shows um, that did have strong female characters, you clung to those one, two shows so strongly, you know, and they were the ones that sort of uh, uh, it kind of uh, nearly defined you. And it's like, it's I just thought it was really sad that all I had was two shows, you know, that, you know, I, I saw someone in myself. And so, yeah, like I, anytime I was trying to create a show or get a show made, I always had like strong female characters. And at the start, it wasn't coming from Brian Bike at all. We were getting from um, uh, um, TV producers and content people that they didn't want shows with female leads because they said, um, what was it? They, 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 they used to say that um, boys or girls will watch a show with a, a boy lead in it, but boys won't watch a show with a girl lead. So therefore, we'll make shows with a boy lead that everyone will watch. And I just thought that sounded really unfair that girls are being and chastise and uh, because they were actually more open-minded and then and I didn't even know where this rule came from it was like how long has this rule been in place you know like should people maybe re-look at this and then um, a lot of these shows like Duck McStuffins and from other companies started coming out and it's just if suddenly the rules just shifted like that they they suddenly realized that it was an obsolete rule and um they uh, yeah all of these shows started getting made with uh, female leads so it was great and like you said, um, like having girls be in strong roles, like maybe not the leader, but also um, the bad guy or the bad, you know, girl in this situation. I think one of the shows we had, we had uh, the the evil person was uh, a principal, like, and she was like about sixty five. So it's like even having it trying to um, change the stereotypes for older women as well. You know, it's like that she was like this you know, black belt ninja type, you know, and it's just to show that um, all types of women and in all lines of work and that can be their own kind of ninjas. Absolutely. And I mean, you're so right what you say about rules. It happens in other walks of life as well, in politics and different walks of life. These rules are chanted out over years and decades without there actually necessarily being any data to back it up. So, I mean, it, oh, I, I heard of so many rules. It was like, it was ridiculous. Yeah. There was like a rule where uh, kids won't watch a show with uh, an ensemble. It's too many characters. And then a show will come out in an ensemble that's a big hit. And suddenly all the shows are ensembles. So it's like, <laughs> I wish someone would throw out There's this a new book. rule. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, you're just to talk about one of your most recent projects, Brona, you're the director of a brilliant new series, Karma's World which arrived on Netflix just last year and it's available here on Netflix in Chile as well. I watched it over the weekend with my two daughters who are nine and five and they loved it. Um, you can see it's made with real love, it's inspiring characters, it's, it's fun, um, you know, but important messages in it too as well. I, I, I mean, tell us, tell us about that project and, and a little about what directing an animation series entails because I suppose when people think of directors they think of the director's chair and shouting action and cut and it's very different obviously on an animation series. Oh yeah like an animation series is like you're you're nearly designing the light switch to the entire world you know like it's not like you're you're starting from scratch it's like a plain you know background and you have to just create everything there's a, a certain god's like you know, like vibe suit. It's 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 kind of cool and funky just to whatever is in your head and the art director's head, you know, actually seeing that come to life, you know, on the screen is just absolutely unreal. But uh yeah, Karma's World, um, I, I loved working on this show because yeah, the the stories were quite meaningful and there were things that you know you go through yourself um growing up. You know, you, you think it's quite a young show, but then some of the messages are quite hard hitting, like there's racial profiling, um, there's um bullying, there's stuff, even things like um when when you lose at something you're good at for the first time, you know, like how how to actually cope with that, you know, feeling of, you know, you're not always going to win at something. And I know with kids that can be um hard, you know, like, or when you're growing out of things that you do with your dad, you know.
you know, like when you're growing up and you're, you don't know how to actually broach that subject. So it's like these small little growing pains and then bigger growing pains as well. And it, it also leads to um, like those kind of stories lead to you, you want lovely nuance in the animation, you know, and trying to get that across. And um, because like really all it is is a puppet and like trying to bring life to that can be quite complicated but like it, it, it's so obsessive when you're doing it like you've no idea how like animators like they 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 think about every single thing right down to like an eye twitch or something and what it's saying about the character and um like it was created by um the rapper Ludacris uh, um Chris Bridges and um he just had such um he has um actually four girls now I think yeah he just had another little baby girl and um he he just wanted to make a show that just really um showed what it was like for them growing up you know and it was just lovely to sort of um to to see that and to have someone who just so knew the characters and what he wanted to get across it was it was just such a charming experience it's really I'm not sure to the whole question <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, the dad character in it is very cool as well. I think that was the big disappointment for my girls that I really didn't compare with this very cool dad for Karma in the show itself. But it is, it is a super series. And I mean, as you said, great messages in there for probably for adults as well as for children. But anyway, um, it, it's, it's uh, on Netflix, Karma's World, and, and uh, great that it's, it's here. And all these things are so available globally as well nowadays. Oh, um, well, sorry. I'm so sorry for interrupting you. I remember what the last part of that uh, question is. Yeah. Yes, you asked about how you, how you make it, you know, so sorry. Um, okay. Um, well, I think the the main thing with animation is, um, yeah, it, it, it is you're creating the whole world and that, but um, they usually once you get a script, you know, you're actually one of the designers, a board artist, they actually draw it out nearly like comic book panels and then they all get assembled um, and timed out so that you know exactly what each shot drawn is going to look like. And then with that, you put on the voices so you can see what, what the edit is going to look like because unlike um film animation costs so much per second um to make that you can have any extra um kind of um anything on the cutting room floor you know everything has to be cut and perfectly just before um it uh gets made i mean we only ever would be maybe about five seconds out from the original um edit uh, when it goes which is crazy like you'd, you'd have hours and hours of footage if you had a film um, and then that would be given to our animators and they would block out the whole thing you know just make the characters maybe go from one side of the screen to the other so you get an overall impression of it and then from that it would be animated fully with the voices put on but like for me um, I think it's coming from a um, um, an art director's point of view for me actually physically building the world that she lives in you know and, and just yeah, realizing how that map translates into all the different places in her world is just so cool it's the world building for me that really I get a kick out of absolutely and that's fascinating about the difference with a, a, a real movie or tv show where you get the impression sometimes half of it is left on the cutting room floor that it's actually very different pressures that apply in animation I think I think there's um yeah in film I think directors and editors like if you have a great editor your movie will like if you're having problems with the movie and um, they can do amazing stuff with it not taking away from our editors they're brilliant but and um, they have a lot less to work with they would do all their work at the start while I think and um, there's a lot to be said in film that a lot of that stuff is in the back end absolutely okay well listen brother we've one final question and i mean as i said this video is to mark st bridget's day when our embassies and consulates around the world celebrate the the achievements of irish women in different areas i mean if you could give one piece of advice to young women not only in ireland but in chile peru ecuador the countries where we are young women who have an interest in forging a career in in animation what what would that advice be um, I think it would be to be loud, be energetic, you know, be excited. I think when you have enthusiasm about something and you love it, you know, um, it, it just comes through in your work, you know, like you can convince anyone to do anything if, if you're just so passionate about it, I think, you know, it, everyone else gets on the, the train once, you know, it looks like, you know, you really know where you want to go and it's going to be really great. And I would say... Uh, when you grow up, a lot of people tell you to grow up, you know, uh, and I'd say in animation, the one thing is to really hold on to your inner child for as long as you physically can, because it's especially when you're making cartoons for younger kids and that, you know, it, it's all things that you experienced as a kid and trying to to 
to bring that to the fore and like to just really just enjoy your quirks as a person because those are the things that um that will help you when like you get into this industry you know like it's full of really quirky fun unusual people and everyone just feeds off each other in that way it's um it's just such a great industry to work in and i would also say that um like when I came up, there wasn't the internet, but now that there is, it's like, just go out and there's so much content and so many um, tutorials um, and there's so much stuff on Pinterest and YouTube about how to do animation. And like, I'd ring up companies, like you always remember those people who rang up and asked so many questions and just really put themselves um, out there, you know, and everyone loves that enthusiasm in kids and like everyone just wants to help everyone take the next step. That's great advice, I think, about bringing enthusiasm to any area you're interested in working in, but clearly, particularly in animation. And listen, Brona, thank you so much. That's just brilliant. I, 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 I think, you know, quality animation has certainly, it's probably never been as popular with parents as during the pandemic when, you know, so many lockdowns in different parts of the world, so much quarantine, inevitably more screen time for children they're, they're probably less time in school and so important in that context not just their intellectual development but their social development their emotional development as well and clearly you know that is something that you and Brownback have championed through so many projects through the years so listen just to say congratulations again uh, well done uh, happy St Bridget's Day and I mean we look forward to following your many successes over the years to come thanks and happy St Bridget states yourself too. I'm from outside of Dundalk, so like I'm always going past the shrine. <laughs> you, you know it well, all the stories. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, brother. <laughs>